next topic is about uh, monitoring server hardware with the IPMI plugin with Isinga or Nagios. And just at the start, a short introduction of mine, what I'm doing. As mentioned, my name is Werner Fischer. I'm working for a server vendor based in Germany for Thomas Quen. And I'm a Linux user for about 10 years by now. And while I'm saying this, I'm somehow recognizing that I have missed um, yeah, giving a party for myself for finishing the 10 years. It's been in some about, about September or October 2001, so maybe at the 20th anniversary I will think about that uh, in time. What I'm not, I'm not a kernel or hardware developer, uh, although we are a hardware vendor and we are selling hardware, we do not um, really design mainboards and stuff like that, um, but um, we have a lot of things to do with IPMI and things like that, so uh, it was a, a way to, uh, to use this technology to monitor servers. Who is Thomas Quen? Thomas Quen is a server vendor based in Germany, as I've mentioned. We are based in Bavaria, so it's been a very short trip for us, luckily here. But we are also uh, serving all customers all about Europe. So last time I had longer trips to take, so it's a pleasure to be here in Nuremberg for me. Some questions at the beginning, and I'm sure you have some ideas or some things to mention, what do you think about that? First of all is the question why we are sitting here for this hour and why do we care about monitoring? And I thought, I thought about that yesterday and a simple answer to me seems that it just depends on what you want to do in your spare time. So if you remember yesterday evening, um, and I think I'm quite sure that nearly all of you have monitoring systems in your uh, environment, so you have enough time to go to the party because you know all your systems are healthy and you don't have to keep all day working in the night. So, and that's also the idea of monitoring hardware. When we think about hardware, it often comes to things like, for example, uh, weight volumes or stuff like that. Monitoring these things is very common and it's been done for many years. Also other things like monitoring network connections is also done for many years and is working properly. But there are further questions behind. So, for example, does the question when you have a server, is it working healthy and how long will it stay working healthy? So the question might be, are all the fans okay? Or are all of the power supplies okay? And that's a very important question because redundant power supplies do not make any sense when one power supply is failing and you won't notice it. It just shifts the time when the server will break, but it doesn't give you any real benefit in, at that point in time. The same thing when you are having a weight five volume, you want to know when a hard drive breaks so you can replace it. So the question is, can we monitor the hardware of all of these servers? Because most of the time when you look into a data center, you don't have the hardware from one single vendor. You have hardware from multiple vendors. And the question is, can we monitor all these servers? Can we monitor them easily? And also, can we monitor them with one single tool? So we don't have to do many things, configuring tools for vendor A, vendor B, vendor C, and stuff like that. And as you might imagine, um, the answer is yes, we can. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, before going further to the agenda and starting with the main topic um, here, uh, one question at the beginning. Who of you is using the IPMI sensor plugin right now? Okay, about 10 or 15 people. That's a good starting point. Who of you uh, know how IPMI is working and what you can do with IPMI? Okay, a little bit more, maybe 16, 17 or 18 people. So it's a good chance to, to use the power of IPMI within the next uh, one or two weeks because it's uh, very easy to implement uh, this plugin. So let's look at the agenda, what will be this uh, talk about. First of all, I'll give an overview how IPMI is working uh, in detail. 
This is very important because there are a bunch of different terms when you talk about IPMI. There are sensors, sensor classes, sensor types, threshold, discrete sensors, and stuff like that. And when you look into it, and once you understand it, it's easy to use it. So I'll give that overview uh, before I go further into the plugin implementation, how the plugin works itself. And after that, I'll give you a short live demo of the system here and also some common pitfalls which you might see when you use IPMI and how you can solve them very easily. When I started to look into IPMI, I was very surprised that IPMI is around for many years by now. The first version of the standard was released in 1998. Um, the current version of IPMI 2.0 has been released also seven years ago. So you have for sure already uh, put servers out of order in your data center which had IPMI and you didn't use it by then. So nearly all of your servers in your data center have IPMI. The standard has been developed by four companies, by Intel, HP, NEC, and Dell. And although it's not uh, ETF or, or IFC or some kind of this standard, it's an industry uh, standard and all server vendors are using it. And that's a big benefit. You can monitor all your servers from different vendors and you don't have to do many configuration things. You just say, I want to monitor all these servers and simply uh, spoken, that's it. Um, to understand um, the reason why IPMI has been developed, I'll go into the main features of IPMI. And there are four main features which have been in mind when the four companies started to develop the standard. Uh, the first and most important topic is the monitoring of the hardware. Like already mentioned, you can monitor things like temperature, fans, power supply, chassis intrusion, and all the things you want to know about your server. Another benefit is that you have the possibility to take recovery actions. Most of you know that um, of, of some remote management cards, um, where you have a web interface and stuff like that, where you can uh, log onto the web interface, do a power on, power off, reset and stuff like that. Um, in most of the cases, when you do those things in, in these web interfaces, the web interface executes an IPMI uh, on IPMI off command or, or things like that. Third point is also very interesting and yes, about two weeks ago uh, I had a reminder that this is very interesting um, because you have the possibility to do a hardware locking in uh, the IPMI processor and yeah, it's been two or three weeks ago when there was uh, the conference in, in Prague, the LinuxCon and I had a talk about SSDs there and for sure, when you are around, something breaks. And uh, in our webshop cluster, the secondary node had, a, had an issue. And we got the reporting, the notifications and stuff like that. And when we looked into the system event logged, we saw that the hardware um, locked, that there have been some ECC errors um, in the main memory. So you have the big advantage when you are searching for hardware failures you don't have to do testing. Is it the motherboard? Is it the, the PRAM? Is it the CPU? You can get very valuable information in there. So you can use this logging functionality. Also, when you don't use the plugin, nearly all of your servers uh, will have that. And you can take advantage of it. And also very interesting, uh, you have the possibility to uh, place inventory information in there. Uh, so for example, for most of the servers, you find things like serial numbers and stuff like that. When you have an, an hardware issue and you want to do an RMA replacement of your hard drive and you have 20 servers all of the same kind and you don't know for which of the servers should I open the RMA call, you can just look into the, the inventory information, see the serial number, and uh, then you can go to your online RMA tool and, and ask for the exchange hard drive. So these are the four main features of IPMI. And in the next slide, we will see how IPMI um, provides all these features uh, within the server hardware. Although this um, picture might 
look a little bit fearing. It's not that complex as it might seem. Um, I've only tried to put all important things on the slides. That's the reason for that. So you see the main board. Um, you have all kinds of things on the main board, uh, CPU, main memory, and stuff like that. And you have also a small chip called a baseboard management controller, or BMC, who is in charge uh, of all the IPMI uh, communication. And on the top side, uh, you see that you can access uh, this BMC via the local area network. Um, when you do the access via the network, you need a username and a password uh, to enable the access. That's the way it should be. It might also be worth looking at your systems because um, in the IPMI standard, there's also a feature called non-authentication. And for some weird servers, this is on by default. So it's good to look at those features also because it might be the case that someone could log into your server, put it on, put it off, or do other strange things with that. But with the modern uh, systems, most of the vendors have uh, cut this off, and so it shouldn't be enabled by default. The other way, uh, for example, when you don't have configured an IP address yet, you can also access the BMC uh, via the local system bus. So when you have a, a, a Linux or Windows or whatever system, uh, you could load uh, uh, some drivers and access the BMC and set, for example, IP address, set users, and stuff like that. These are things which you can also do sometimes within the server BIOS, but when the server is already running and in production, uh, you don't need to reboot your server for that. So, although that's a nice thing to communicate with the BMC, it's not the, the things that we want. Uh, we want to get information about uh, the server. We want to use all those sensors. So those sensors are connected to the BMC via an I2C bus. Um, there are different kinds of sensors, which we will see later on. Um, there's also the possibility uh, to have sensors in things like memory boards or so. Often you see memory temperatures and stuff like that. And there's also a connection right on the top, the green um, box over there, where you see uh, the remote management option or remote management card, where you have KVM over IP access. That's the typical web interface you get with a uh, remote uh, adapter from Dell, HP, Supermicro, Intel, um, whoever is uh, selling you the system. So these web interfaces can also communicate with the BMC. They can get information about the sensors, but you don't want to log in to uh, those web interfaces every morning to see if everything is fine. You want to do this automatically with Isinger or Nagios. And for the other features, uh, for the logging functionality, you see this kind of uh, non-volatile storage uh, where you have information about uh, the sensors, which sensors are in place, and also the so-called sell the system event log. That's how IPMI is built. Um, when we look at the possibility how we can connect uh, to the BMC via the network, I've already mentioned that you need a username and a password. And for that, there are three different kinds of privilege levels for that. You could use the user privilege le level, the operator privilege level, or the administrator privilege level. And when you do monitoring, it's very important to just use uh, the user privilege level, because otherwise, if someone would break into your Singer or into your Nagio system, he would get usernames and passwords for switching all your servers in your data center, and that's not a nice uh, thing to think of. So very important, use only user privilege level for monitoring purposes, not more. Um, for other things, you can use operator or administrator privileges when you want to, to power on the power off a system. It's also possible when you have clustered system to use IPMI for things like Stunnet to put a server out of production, power it on again. There you can use operator privileges and the administrator is only necessary for yourself because with that privilege level you can also change IP addresses and stuff like that which is not possible when you have only operator privilege levels. So that's really an important thing, and um, that's the reason why it's written in that big font on the slide. 
There are plenty of different tools which you can use for IPMI. One of them is this tool IPMI tool. It's the most common known tool and that's the reason why I'm mentioning it here too. It comes with every Linux distribution. Um, it's also within FreeBSD and other uh, Unix systems. You could use this tool uh, very easily to put the server on, put it off, query for the current power status like we see it here. Uh, we have the connection to a host which has the IP address uh, 192.168.1.211 uh, for the BMC processor and it's important to note that this IP address has nothing to do with the IP address of the operating system of the server here. It's really an independent IP address and we use the admin user put in the password and see the power is off then we do a power on and then we see the power is on. When we are connecting to those server systems, I've mentioned that the IP address is unique, has nothing to do with the operating system. But depending on the server, you can use uh, an individual uh, NIC for that or you can share the first onboard NIC or the second onboard NIC for that. It just depends on how many ports you have in your data center. If you have a dedicated real hardware management LAN, then you use the dedicated port. And when you have the management also in your same production network, you could use, for example, the same uh, network interface as is, ha is used for the operating system, but you have a different MAC address on there. You could use VLAN, for example, so there are a bunch of possibilities for that too. And that's very convenient when you want to automate th some things. Uh, it would also be possible when you want to automate things for recovery actions to do power off, power on, or stuff like that. So going further, when we talk about IPMI sensors, we're coming to one slide which looks a little bit more complicated than the ones before, uh, but this is a good reason. This has a good reason. Main reason is that there are two types of sensor classes within IPMI. And that's very beneficial for the use of IPMI because you have a bunch of possibilities with that. For example, you could use on the left side the discrete sensors, and those discrete sensors have the possibility to use up to 15 different yes or no states. So this is very convenient, for example, when you have a power supply, you don't get a value the power supply is working okay with 725 something. Uh, you have the information, the power supply is, pr is present, the power supply has a power on the inlet, and the power supply is working uh, correctly within itself. So you have up to 15 different stages which you can use, and in the standard there are also definitions for different types of sensors. So for example, for power supplies, the, the IPMI um, specification says that there's the possibility the power supply is uh, available, it's having power on the inlet and stuff like that. For fan red redundancy, there would be other sensors there. So you can have generic states like it's available, it's not available, and sensor specific states like power supply has power on the inlet, that's not of use for a, a fan redundancy sensor when you have power supply, uh, power inlet. So you have those sensor specific states. And you could use also uh, some OEM type of sensors for things like that. Uh, for example, for those super micro systems like this one here, there is an uh, OEM sensor for the temperature of the CPU which has low, medium and high. And this is also implemented via those discrete functionality. On the other side, on the left, you have those threshold-based sensors, and those sensors uh, change the status um, on depending on the analog reading compared to different threshold values. So you're getting two kinds of information um, here. You get an analog reading of the sensor. For example, for a temperature sensor, you get the information temperature is 28 degrees uh, Celsius, and you get also a discrete threshold comparison status bit, which just gives you the information, this sensor is okay, or 
the state of the sensor is not okay. For example, when the temperature is 50 degrees Celsius and you're having a threshold value of 40 degrees within uh, uh, the uh, sensor information in the server, you get the information something is wrong here. And the main benefit for you as a user is that all these kinds of thresholds have already been set by your server vendor. So you don't have to think about what might be the best temperature for this server or, or what might be the lowest possible uh, RPM number for a fan. Um, those values have been set by your server vendor and that's the main benefit because you can easily just check all your sensors and all of the sensors are giving you the information I'm okay or I'm not okay. And then you can just implement it as a, a service within Nagios or Singer. We can see this here. Uh, again, on the left side, we have a discrete sensor that I mentioned power supply. This has been taken uh, from an uh, Intel based server, an older system, it's uh, SR2500, so four or five years old, but it already has those kinds of features in there. So we see that this sensor can have four different states. It's a discrete sensor. It can have the information presence detected, failure detected, predictive failure, or power supply AC lost. And we see that the power supply has been detected. It's in there, but it has lost its power on the inlet. And that's a very valuable information for me as an administrator because I don't have any need to open an arm A call for the power supply at my vendor, but I can call my service uh, employee to go and look what's happening in the service center. And if I got the information, power supply, AC is fine, but failure detected of the power supply, I can save the money for the serviceman going into the data center because I can first order the, the power supply and then tell the, the service uh, guy to, to exchange it. So very valuable information in there. Uh, it's important to say that not all server systems have all of these detailed sensors, it just depends on the server. But on the right side, we, th we see some threshold sensors, and those sensors are in place for nearly all servers. We see a fan, a fan sensor, with a rotation of 5,700 something, and we see we have lower critical and lower non-critical uh, values in there, so we see that there are different kinds of threshold values. When we go below 1,978, we get a warning. And when we go below 1,720, we get the critical back. And that just fits very fine for Nagios or Singer. <laughs> so same things here. Very nice to use it. As you can see, we have some different sensor classes, discrete and threshold, but we have also some different so-called sensor types, which means this threshold-based sensor has the sensor type fan, and the other discrete power supply sensor has um, the sensor type power supply. And you could use tools like the IPMI sensors tool from free IPMI, or when you have nothing to do, you can go and take the 800 pages of the IPMI specification and find the table. Um, easier way is that way. You can list all the possible um, sensor types. And this is also a very nice thing because when you're using the plugin later on, you can decide whether you just want to use one single service check for a server of yours. So you monitor all IPMI sensors within the server with one service. Or if you want to say, I want to have the information about temperature, voltage, fan in different services, you could use those sensor types to distinguish between those different types. And as we are already using some of the IPMI tools, in that case we are using free IPMI, the free IPMI suite which has different kinds of tools. One of them is IPMI sensors. I can show you another output of the free IPMI suite um, where, just, where we just see you can use a command called IPMI monitoring and there we get the list of all of the sensors. And the nice thing here is that we get the information whether the sensor is fine or not uh, within the fourth column. So when there is nominal, everything is fine 
And when there's something different, something has broken. And that was the starting point of the plugin because this is really a good output for parsing and uh, giving information further down to Isinger or to Nagios. And here we see some physical security sensor which has the state critical because there's been some chassis intrusion detected here. So for those uh, discrete sensors, one might think, okay, those yes, no information kind of stuff, maybe a different meaning for different people. Um, so when you're talking about, for example, redundant power supplies, and you're having a server with uh, four uh, height units, for example, three power supplies, and uh, you have all of them in place, and you can say just one power supply is enough to run the server. You could say, do I want to have a warning when I have two power supplies uh, running, to have it warning or critical? And this can be done within the free IPMI configuration here. There's a file called free IPMI interpret sensor.conf and there's a very useful default configuration in there where you can see a list of all those discrete status information. So for here we see, for example, um, things about physical security, things about power supply, or things about memory. And for memory, we distinguish between ECC errors, which are correctable, so one-bit errors within the memory, and uncorrectable ECC errors, um, where you have two bits failing. And the default configuration is that when there is a correctable ECC error, uh, you get a warning message. But if you want to say, I want to get an, a critical alert from a singer, you just put in their critical and you're fine, and you can do it in this way. So, very useful there too. As mentioned before, you also have this kind of uh, error log, system event log. Here we have also some information uh, where the power redundancy has been lost. You could use different tools like IPMI to log also the tools of the free IPMI suite to get this information from the uh, system event log. An important hint for this is that depending on your server, you get also a lot of messages when you boot the server, for example, uh, or when you do things like kernel updates, you do a reboot, you get a lot of messages there or once you have uh, some ECC errors, it fills up. Um, you have about 10,000 lines within this log, so it can happen that this log is getting full. So it's a good idea to look at it, whether is it full or not, because when it's full, you get no additional information uh, locked in there. So just look in there and, and be sure that it is empty. Uh, you could save this output in the file and then you can, can erase it. So. Let's look at the implementation. How does the, the plugin work? It's a very simple plugin. It's just a bash script. We're also working on a, on a Perl port. We got some uh, feedback from the community for that, for Solaris environments. And we will release this Perl-based version too. So just depending on what you want to use. What you need to use is free IPMI and for the bash version, uh, JAWK, uh, to be able to pass the output. And here we see an example uh, how the plugin is executed. We see check IPMI sensors executed at the single server. Uh, the IP address of the BMC um, is 10.10.10.114. And here we have an uh, IPMI configuration file. It's also a feature from free IPMI where we can put in the uh, username, password, and stuff like that and ensure that those uh, passwords can only be read uh, by the user who is executing the script. You would also have the possibility to give um, command line options uh, for free IPMI instead of that configuration file. It just depends on how you want to use it. The better way is this way because when you're using the configuration uh, with the options, you just need to have the possibility to uh, supply the password for that and then you will see the password in the process list of the server. So the most secure way is to use 
this configuration file, and that's the way uh, we recommend it to use it. And then we get the output uh, just like it's, it's defined by the Nagios plugin development guidelines. We have the uh, status information, and we have the pipe symbol and get bunch of performance uh, data, and for sure the return code, which is saying, is it OK, is it a warning, is it critical? So in that case, we're very fine. We're seeing that all sensors are OK, and we're getting the values for all uh, of the threshold-based sensors where we get an analog reading value, so we can use that for PNP, for Nagios, or in Graph, or something like that. Um, in that case, uh, we have no verbose level set, so we get only one, um, uh, uh, one information here, and this is OK. If there would be a warning, it would be here. But you can configure it if you have, uh, if you're using your um, your sensor types, um, or you can could raise the, the the output level. Okay, we see it here. Uh, when you're raising the verbose level of that uh, tool, you get this information for all of the sensors more uh, more in detail then. And the nice thing is you get a, a very clear illustration within the web interface, like we see in Isinga here. Uh, normally. We see the status is OK, and in that case, we see status is critical. Um, there's been some chassis intrusion detected. We see all of the performance data here, so a very convenient, convenient way. And another thing I haven't mentioned yet is you have another possibility to use the plug-in, just in case you don't want to configure for 500 servers IPMI usernames and password, because you have already NRPE or something like that in place. You could also use the plugin uh, B1 at each individual server and queuing it over NRPE. Then the plugin will use the local access, so you just need to ensure that uh, you have, with sudo or stuff like that, enough uh, system rights to, to access the IPMI device. And then you don't need any network kind of stuff from IPMI. You just use NRPE like you do before. This is the information about the theoretical things. Now it's getting interesting for me because live demos are always yeah, a little bit strange, but we will see how it will work. So, different size. Okay, seems fine. Uh, we, I hope. Has there been some? Uh, for some reason, I've lost ah the power maybe. That's a very good timing. <laughs> um, my laptop is using its own UPS, the battery pack, but hmm, maybe we could look why we've lost power here. I've never had this kind of timing yet. <laughs> I've heard some beep somewhere, some seconds before, but somehow there's no power anymore. <laughs> but why is the, the beamer still working? I don't know. Ah. Okay. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> we will see. Ah. <laughs> Okay, that's, that wasn't the thing I wanted to show you. <laughs> For sure. Okay, but why not? Okay, so um, we're having now the situation that there's been some other alert. <laughs> and we're seeing that the server has been done, uh, has been uh, out of uh, work. So you see it's not some faked flash video or something like that. <laughs> um, and we see that the IPMI service is currently un unknown. So I can click here for the information. Um, it just needs some seconds also for the BMC to boot up um, and also for the, the noise to go down again. Again, a good timing. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, but it will, it will get down for sure, I'll promise you. Um, <laughs> and we have a nice thing here. We see the 
uh, execution of the of the tool failed with return code, and we have also getting some information how the plugin has been executed because uh, I've seen on the mailing list many users asking some things why it doesn't work, and then I asked them if they could just provide uh, the very verbose output with the verbose level three, and then they didn't know how the uh, plugin was executed. So when there is a, uh, an error here, uh, the user gets the information. He can just um, use, for example, um, his um, his shell, and then use, for example, the post level three. And yeah, in that case, I was too slow. Um, but you get all the repose output here for debugging purpose. So this is working too. That's a nice, a nice thing. Um, I'll give that to the site again. Let's do some, some refresh. OK. Um, just needed some seconds for that. Now we see that everything is fine again. And now I come to the real demo I have planned. Um, the main interesting thing would be, for example, to, to just uh, use a power cord, but this makes some noise, so I thought it's a better idea to use a simple just intrusion. That's a better noise value for that. Um, so in that case, I opened uh, the cover. Here's the chassis intrusion sense of the server. Um, we see that the service is checked um, every minute. Um, so I can go a little bit before and execute it manually on the command line, and we will see what we will get. On the command line, we get the information. It's critical because the chassis intrusion is critical. And here we see that we only get the information about the sensors which are critical or in warning state. We don't get information for the 10, 15, 20, whatever sensors which are OK. So it's very good to send it via SMS or stuff like that. And we're still getting the performance data on there too. And we see we have a return code of 2, meaning that we will have a critical state here. So. Let's do a refresh here. OK, same thing again. We have now the information something is critical. And we see it's the chassis intrusion here. So really convenient way. And the main advantage here is really you don't need to configure any values for those uh, analog readings. You don't have to think of whether it's an IBM, Intel, HP, Supermicro, Intel, Thomas Klein, whatever server. You can monitor all of your servers. And we're seeing it on the mailing list that the plugin is used for many different vendors, and it's working. It's working fine. Yeah, it's it's working. It's working fine. Um, most of the time, it's working fine um, because there are also some common pitfalls. One of them is that you are getting sensors which have a state of NA, not available. Most of the time, you get some kind of OEM event. This just means that the vendor has implemented an OEM type of uh, sensor, which is allowed by the, uh, by the specification. Um, but free IPMI hasn't yet information about whether this bit is fine or is not fine. So in this way, you have a, a shortest term solution. You could just exclude those sensors. You have the ID of the sensors in the first column. That's 12 and 13 in that case. Um, to exclude those sensors from your checks. You cannot use the name because the name um, isn't for sure unique. So there are also servers around where you have 10 temperature sensors. You don't know where they might be, but you need the ID to identify them. And the short term solution is that you are uh, uh, looking for a free IPMI update. Uh, just ping L2, the developer, free IPMI on the development mailing list. And it normally takes 24 to 48 hours until he includes the sensor when he has any information about those sensors. So it might be necessary to contact Intel, Supermicro, or whoever um, to get the information. And yeah, meanwhile, we had, um, I think, five or 10 sensors updated within the last year or so. So it's a really nice open source project, this free IPMI. 
another possibility of a pitfall would be an unrecognized event. Um, in this case, we have having some uh, remote management card and the status of the board um, is an unrecognized event. Um, shortest term solution is also here ignore. Middle term or long term solution would be to again contact L2 and, and try to get the information from the from the vendor in that case. So you always have the shortest term solution to ignore those sensors and then you're having all the rest of the sensors in a fine in a fine state. So to come to some conclusions, um, as only 10 or 15 people are using the plugin by now, I really recommend to just go to thomas-grand.com slash en slash OSS. They replace our open source uh, parts. There's also a mailing list at lists.thomas-grand.com with a announcement mailing list, uh, a user mailing list, and a developer mailing list. There are currently about 80 or 90 people on the lists, so we really see that sensors are reported which aren't working. We are giving information to L2 or free IPMI. The sensors are included, and um, you're fine. And by now, we have got many contributions from those people. I'm not sure if any one of you is, is here, here yet. Uh, I just want to to thank all of you for, for giving feedback and um, giving us the possibility to, to get the plugin working for, for all servers. So just before you can leave for the next break, I really encourage you to monitor your hardware with a single IPMI because when there are problems, they will tell you and it really will save you time and money and will ensure that you can go to the party at the next year's OMC2 um, and you don't have to, to fix the server where the second power supply is broken. You can fix the first broken power supply one week before you can go to, to Nuremberg. So just use, for example, also this, uh, this article. You can get it also on our website. Um, they have all the information about the talk uh, here. And if there are any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. If you don't have access to the to the hardware, um, how to read the sensors with the IPMI plugin? Can you access the uh, the management board, for example, with IPMI? Um, most of the time, uh, the IPMI um, service is working on the management um, NIC. So in that case, for example, I've configured um, um, the, the the management process to be in place on the first onboard NIC. But when you use the dedicated NIC, from all of the servers which I know, there's the possibility to provide this IPMI service on the management NIC. So when you're responsible just for, for running the data center, you don't have access to the servers themselves. When you have access to your um, WAC or whatever uh, remote management card, uh, you should get the IPMI service running on there. It's on UDP port 623 or so. So you just need also to configure um, the, the firewall to get the access and for sure to configure the users to, to read the, the sensors. I'd like to pick up the question we've had before. So, okay. uh, he's been asking for the, the warning at the critical thresholds in the plugin yeah. output. I think he was referring to the performance data part of ah, the plugin output. Yeah. So yeah. That, would, that would be great. That, that's, that's missing. Yeah, um, that's a thing uh, which could be implemented. And it's, uh, it's nice to hear that you're having this question. Because just one or two days before I came uh, here to the conference, uh, I got another contribution from one guy uh, providing this functionality. So um, he only used uh, a pseudonym, so maybe he's in here. I would like to talk to him. <laughs> but um, this is a, a functionality which you could use. Or you have also another possibility for those um, threshold-based sensors. Um, you could also change the pre-configured values of the server with, IPMI, uh, with the IPMI tools. So when you're using free IPMI, for example, um, I just could, as I'm having some minutes left, I just try to activate my network, my wireless network, um, because we have an article in our wiki on that. Maybe. 
Hm, okay, Hotspot, Passwort. Wo ist mein Passwort? Okay. So. Just a thing of seconds. It's not that fast, so maybe you stop surfing in the internet and mine will get faster. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Comment. maybe maybe it, it, it will come. You find an, uh, an article within our week. You could go, go to wiki.thomas-kern.com and there is a section um, about uh, IPMI and there is the information how to change those threshold values, for example, when your server window says um, temperature is okay on the board till 46, 56, whatever degrees Celsius, uh, you could say, okay, I want to have a warning when it's 40 degrees. And then you could, could change it on there. So, uh, yeah, you have to check it afterwards. <laughs> but it's possible to, to, to use that functionality. And the one thing you might be aware of, it depends on the server, whether or not those changed values uh, are stored permanently in the non-volatile storage, or if you have to again uh, uh, set them when you have uh, a hard reset, when you put out the power plugs and put, it, put them in again. This might, might happen. But otherwise, you could change those values on there too, then you don't need to, to, to use uh, options of the plugin for that. In case there are any other questions, we are also having um, some servers on there. And we also bring that server back to, uh, um, to the booth. So we are here till the evening, so just uh, ask me when you have any, any comments on that. For the questions? <coughs> Otherwise, well, book my this link. Thomas Crane is uh, doing a good job to maintain a very interesting wiki. and. Well, another suggestion, IPMI security is a very important part of ERP secu IT security. There exists uh, at least uh, one large, well-known German public entity where IPMI played uh, an important role in the successful hack of their environment. So, take care of it. So, if there are no further questions, thank you very much. I'm a Thank you.